Uh, <laughs> so I'll move on to item one uh, on the agenda, which is declaration of interest. If, uh, <coughs> Can you make any indication known, please? Convener, we've uh, received a declaration from uh, Councillor Goldie. A declaration of interest? Sorry, yes. it, so it wasn't a declaration, it was just to wholeheartedly back the convener on his thanks to everyone within the North yeah. Lancashire set up okay. over the last number of months. It's been an absolutely terrible time for any authority to have to deal with. Uh, just from the SNP group, thank you very much for all you've done so far. Yeah. Uh, just with a caveat, we're not out of the woods yet, so hopefully we've got yeah, things good. under control. Thanks for that, Wally. Um, so I take it we haven't got any declaration of interest, so moving swiftly on to well, um, number two in the agenda, um, and it's the winter services policy. Robert, sorry, Robert, sorry, Councillor McPike. So, sorry, Councillor McPike. Sorry to interrupt. Councillor Anderson's wish to raise a point of order. Councillor Anderson, can you indicate the standing order number which you wish to raise a point of order under? It's not a number. It's about order in the meeting. There's an awful lot of mics unmuted, and I, I'm really struggling to hear. Sorry, I totally agree with you, Lynn. I'm, I'm going to keep my mic on for the sake of being the chair, but I've asked everybody. Or comment in the, the chat bar and it'll be picked up. So moving swiftly on to item number two, winter services policy. Robert, are you going to speak to this? Councillor McPake, it's Nicole. I'll speak to this. Nicole, item. sorry, Nicole. On you go. Thank you. It's okay. Thank you, convener. Um, members will be familiar with the winter policy document, which comes before members every year with recommendations following the review of the previous year's winter service. This review comes today with no changes in planned delivery from last year. I would remind members at this point that the policy covers normal day-to-day -day winter service delivery, not an event such as Beast from the East, which we saw um, two years ago. So to recap, there's to be no change to the delivery, planned delivery from last year, and that follows um, a significant review which is undertaken every year with our partners um, in AMI. One area I would wish to point out to members, though, is that following the Council's budget decision in February 2020, a matrix which is shown in Appendix D of the report has been developed to undertake the requested rationalisation of grit bin provision across the network, ensuring provision in areas most in need um, remain uh, serviced by grit bins. Service 2. Section 2.5.1 of the paper states that this will be carried out over successive winters to avoid excessive one-off significant removal um, and disposal costs, uh, not least um, the, a removal of service to members of the public. Just to reiterate that, as always, maps are available um, online of all the gritting routes. Printed maps will again be provided to members, and it's anticipated that this year, for the first time, that real-time gritter information when the gritters are deployed will be made available online for this winter season. I would therefore ask the mem that members consider the contents of the report and the appendix, and that secondly agree the proposed winter service policy and procedures for 2020-21 as the basis of winter service delivery in the coming year. Of course, I'm happy to take any questions, convener. Thanks for that, Nicole. I can see two uh, names here. I've got Willie Goldie and uh, Willie Dillon. But before we say that, uh, any further, what we really should remember about last year and you know, was really a cold winter a lot of people might not think so but the gritting the route gritting from late september right in until right into the start of lockdown which was uh, the 22nd of march they were still out uh, uh, using the road salt at that time so a lot was a you know wasn't a lot of snow but there was a hell of a lot of uh, hard work went on last year as well so i would just like to say that molly goldie please thanks can be Questions and uh, possibly a comment of that. Uh, we'll start off. Is there a mechanism for increasing the priority of a road or footpath should any increase in accident and incidents due to ice on the surface caused by the result of uh, water runoff? It's just we think we do have a number of new developments within North Lanarkshire. Have we looked at that? I know last year's policy was for last year, but we probably had new developments online there. Do you want to take them one at a time or do you want me to go through the whole lot? 
I'd probably rather take them one at a time if that's okay. That's fine, that's fine by me. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so in response to the first question, um, yes, although we're looking at a rationalisation, of course, as a mechanism, we understand that North Lanarkshire continues to grow um, and that there is a mechanism for bringing on but basically each grip bin, if a request is made, as it's brought on, it will be tested against the matrix in terms of the priority. So that forms the, the key prioritisation for uh, grip bins across North Lanarkshire. The one caveat that I probably should have mentioned is that outside schools, the grip bins will remain regardless, so they don't need to, to fit to the matrix. But yes, there is the ability to bring grip bins on, but bearing in mind that the, the, the fundamental of this exercise is to rationalise the grip bins that we have already. Okay. Thanks for that. Uh, and just on the grip bin, if we recognise the matrix for it, uh, if we found somewhere that there was a, you've probably answered that, if there was an area that we've missed out because there's a danger to the public, is there a mechanism for a request to be made? Yes. And who would make that request? Would it be the council, the police or the community? Um, Thanks, Councillor Goldie. Regardless of who makes the request, it will be taken through the matrix in exactly the same way in terms of the assessment process, so that there absolutely remains an ability for us to add grip bins if it fulfils the, the, the matrix. Okay. Uh, the next one is uh, just on clarification of the grip bins. Within the policy, it says there's a contractual obligation to fill the bins by October, and then there's a wee bit on it that says only filled by request going forward. Is that after the initial filling in October? Or did, is this really the only to be filled upon request going forward? Is the the question really? Yeah, yeah, no, that, that that's a good question. Um, so just just to clarify, what we're proposing is that we don't do the one off. Now it's often not a fill. You'll be aware if you have grit bins um, any anywhere within your constituencies that they lie with a, a level of grit in them. And only when we see an event more often, like um, they mentioned that again, beef from the east. Um, do we see grit bins emptied over any given winter? Ordinarily, they are not used by the public to any great degree. So the exercise where we go around and fill them once at the outset of the year um, is an expensive one, it is a contractual one. Um, and what we don't want to do is fill them to the brim, that they don't get used. And then, to be honest, any grit that we would take out of those grit bins would need to be fully disposed of. It yeah. can't be added to the stockpile again. So what we don't want to do is create a greater problem for ourselves. But of course, the caveat remains, that if any of those grit bins should run dry at any point, or if we were to see, I hesitate to say it, a beast from the east, but given how 2020 is gone, we're preparing for anything. Yeah. And so if, if we should see a severe winter event, then of course we'll relook at that and the, the bins will be topped up. But what we're trying to do is prevent filling bins, which we thereafter look to remove and incur additional costs. Yeah. That's fine. Uh, the last one is really on the mechanism for removing the bins. We know that we say if a bin isn't used, we'll remove it. It may take a couple of years. Just the concern is they may be used for receptacle, receptacles for waste. Generally, if they're left, un, left unfilled, the public may stick anything they want in them or that. Do we have the mechanism for that? Obviously, you'll know how often they're filled or that, but can they be removed fairly quickly? Yeah, no, that's that's a really good point. Um, yes, they can be removed really quick. There's no reason why we cannot go in and remove them. The work which needs to go on in the in the background, and it has already commenced, is that obviously we review each and every grip bin location that we have currently against the matrix, um, and then we'll go in in a phased programme and remove them. What we didn't want to do is do a, a one-hit wonder and start to take out vast numbers of, of bins. Um, we want to make it um, so that we don't overstretch ourselves because you, you'll be conscious that, of course, after COVID, that it's the same teams um, from our partners and Amy who are undertaking yeah. our capital programme resurfacing, et cetera, as well. So we'll go in on a phased basis and remove them. But absolutely, if any are becoming um, nuisances in the local environment in terms of being set on fire or used for other purposes, of course, we can go in and remove them. Yeah. Thank you, Convener. You'll be pleased to hear I'm nearly finished. <laughs> it's, it's just really on, carry on. the comment to note the the attacks on bin crews and gritting crews, and to say it's absolutely terrible. And I hope that we have an active policy of reporting it to the police. And that's all. That's all I've got on this item. Thanks, thanks yeah, Nicole. Right. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, thanks for that, Willie. I know uh, Amy are very, very proactive. Every single, every single instant of a, a an attack on a gritting gritting uh, machine or uh, operator is reported to police as a matter of course. Okay, thanks, um, Wally Dillon. You wanted to come in? 
Thanks, convener. Convener, I wish to express my concerns. It's in relation to paragraph 2.5, salt bins 2.5.1. And I have noted, convener, that we are, well, we're talking about a rationalisation of the bins. I have noted that we are speaking here about a reduction of 500 and 38 uh, bins within our communities. And I think that is a serious, serious indictment on the people within our communities. Two years ago, as Nicole referred to, we had the heavy snow, the, the frost, everything like that. Now, we stood in the council chamber and each and every one of us applauded the efforts and the hard work that were put in by people in the community, the communities rather, eh, in order to keep our communities moving. And I mean, from the communities that I certainly represent, eh, colleagues, I do not see eh, a mass over provision within the communities, especially that I do represent, and I think you could be cutting off the lifeline here in the communities by taking this or enforcing this mass reduction in the grip bands. And I would ask us to reconsider this uh, position because I think they do play a vital role in the communities and they're well used by the people in our communities. It's only my thoughts, convener, but I felt it was necessary to express some here uh, this afternoon. Thanks. No, thanks for that, Willie. Um, before I hand over to uh, Nicole, this is uh, actually a budget decision we're uh, acting out here. The, the decision was taking the budget of 2020 to rationalise the uh, grip bins, so all we're doing is acting on that. Nicole, would you like to add anything to that? Yeah, thank you, convener. That that was one of the points I was going to make. Um, Councillor Dolan and, and elected members, have, if I might offer you some comfort just to, to review some of the background to this, um, you'll be conscious, of course, that in the paper we talk about the increase in grip bins from 760 to 2,693 um, over the period of the, the contract with um, Amy Public Services. What happened over that period of time is that whenever any member of the public made a request for a bit, grip bin, regardless of the reason for that, the grip bin was provided, hence the reason for the growth. So the real purpose of this, is, as was discussed, I know, um, in the budget meetings as well, is that we actually begin to rationalise so that, um, as with all our resources, that we start to put them out where they can be most effective. And that's really the point for the matrix, the transparency of the matrix, of the different factors um, that we can take into account, that we should take into account before we put out a grip bin. And the other point that I would make is, I use it in my introduction, it's just to highlight that the grit bins that we talk about, the winter service, which is contained within this policy, is for normal. It's for a normal year. So whenever we see an event, and I hesitate to mention it again, but we, but we all know what it looks like, so a, a beast from these. Whenever we see an event like that, there are further contingencies made to respond to that for communities. So this is absolutely not about um, removing the very necessary um, grit bins for communities. The matrix will ensure that those are there, that they're prioritised, that they remain um, filled and available for community use. It is for normal, so if there's ever another extreme event, um, then what we'll do is we'll look at further contingencies, for instance, community salt piles, um, which is something that, that we've done before. So just to offer members some comfort, I hope, in that. OK, thanks for that, Nicole. I don't see any um, MD else want to come in. Convener, so... um, Councillor uh, Ashraf has asked... Our... Oh, sorry, sorry, Janaid. Sorry, Janaid. I've I just, I just come up there now. Sorry, Janaid, on you go. No, no, no worries, Convener. Um, it was just uh, firstly in relation to uh, 2.4.1, uh, Innovation and Technology. It, it had been said that it was unforeseen technical issues that uh, that it wouldn't be rolled out. The um, uh, GPS sort of things on the vehicles, but Nicole, did you say there it would be rolled out for this year, or is it next year? Uh, when it says coming winter, does it mean this winter coming up? Yeah, Councillor Ashraf, I'm sorry if I didn't make that clear earlier. Yes, so it's anticipated work is still going on um, at Full Pell, and it is fully anticipated that we will have that up and working for this season, so from the commencement of winter service in October, 
um, that yourselves and any member of the public would be able to go online and see the actual position of the gritting fleet, and um, that's both uh, road and footpath gritters um, in real time. Sure, that sounds fantastic. Um, and just uh, secondly, um, uh, you, you'd already part answered the uh, question in your last response there, but it was just um, also we have like a usual plan for year on year for our, our winter service plan. Obviously, you said that there was like an emergency contingency plan just in case of what happened in 2010 or what happened. Uh, uh, obviously, from the beast from the east. Um, I don't think I've ever seen that before. Has that been brought forward towards this committee? I mean, what uh, what are the further contingency plans? Is, is this written in a plan somewhere where we can go read it? Um, the for if there's an extreme sort of situation. Okay, so in terms of the extreme situations, then there's no specific plan for, for winter as such, and I'm, I'm sure Andrew will come in as he feels necessary here as well. Um, the reality is that for each extreme event, um, we look at it on its merits. Um, and as you'll be aware, uh, from the winters of 2010, for example, um, as well as two years ago, these are, are quite different events in terms of um, how severely they hit North Lanarkshire, um, how prolonged they are, and some of the specific difficulties. If you remember back in 2010, a lot of the issues um, around winter were the ice that formed because of the, the longevity, which wasn't such an issue um, two years ago. So really, the response when it's out with a, a normal winter um, it really has to be tailored, um, and that is is work which our roads teams do along with the emergency response planners, who are very very effective um, at looking at each and every situation, as in they are um, even at the moment, um, to 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 pull forward the the work that's necessary to respond to the emergency situation. Andrew, I don't know if you would want to add anything to that. Thanks, Nicole. Yeah, I would uh, just add to that, um, Councillor. Um, it's Every service has its business continuity measures um, in place and business continuity planning arrangements. And obviously, um, the, any sort of winter event doesn't just affect roads, it affects every service, but specifically roads. Um, and they will have that as part of their contingency arrangements as to what they do in the event of um, a, a severe weather event. Um, convener, um, I just wanted to say, just in relation to obviously that point, I mean, uh, it just seems a bit remiss that we don't have a specific plan for. An emergency. I mean, I do realise that you're saying that it needs to be tailored for every event that's happening. But I mean, I do remember in 2018 when this all kicked off from the beast from the east. Basically, we we did have a number of questions from constituents. Uh, I'm sure everyone else did as well, saying basically this has already happened about five six years ago. Why don't we have something in place? I mean, I myself, I got stuck in Glasgow for five days. Um, surely there should be something, you know, a little yeah. bit of a starting plan from that. Yeah. 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 Can I come in, come in there and say we do have a, a meeting of a contingency plan at the start of winter, the winter period, and that's it takes in all aspects of the council from housing to roads to waste solutions to every aspect. We do do that contingency at the start of every winter period, so it, it does take place. And it's it's uh, it links into the Scottish government as well, so that does already happen. It just it's not a full committee. It's just um, I can mean it. And um, it's all the service managers are there, and we make sure everything, all the boxes are ticked, so we are ready for anything that may happen. So I hope that gives you some reassurance that it does already take place. No, thank you, Convener. Okay. Well, thanks for that, colleagues. Can I then uh, point you to page five with the recommendations there, and can I ask for approval on that? And if I don't hear anything otherwise, we'll go forward. Is that okay? That's approved. So moving on to item four, sorry, three, updating the uh, depot rationalisation. I think that's you, Andrew. Yes, indeed, Kavina, thanks very much. Yep, just the, the report, as it, as it says, just really to update the, the committee on the, the depot rationalisation exercise it's taken across um, the council. Um, section 2.1 of the report really just refers to the intention, which is to reduce the overall number of depots from 10 down to five in the short term. And then in a medium term plan to reduce that down um, to overall two. The actual table itself provides the details of the, the current depot facilities that we've got and the ones that we will be moving to. Um, and it's worth pointing out at that stage that the original intention was for the waste service to wholly locate to the Bells Hill um, depot. However, um, after further review, um, it was considered that there would be um, significant um, route efficiencies if we actually had a waste presence up at Ward Park in Cumbernauld which would allow the north of the area to be serviced from Ward Park. Um, so that now has, has been done, and um, they, we have six of our collection vehicles based up there, 
and we're now looking to extend that and um, to maybe um, include minibuses and the like as well to make best use of the facility. Um, in terms of what else has been done already, um, it's really in 2.5 to, to 2.7 there. Um, land management previously had a, a support asset management team based at Bells Hill. They have since moved out, which then has allowed the um, waste and fleet support services to be wholly located within the Bells Hill depot. And that's to deliver the saving of 165,000, which was planned for this year. Um, the table in 2.7 provides an, an indication on the timelines for the future um, depot moves. So really what we're saying is that by the end of um, October, we will have reduced our overall a depot footprint from 10 down to 5. It is also worth pointing out this time in, in section 2.8 that the existing fleet workshop over the past six months had extensive um, uh, water penetration. Um, so as a result of that, we commissioned um, a full structural survey um, of the building, which is, for those that don't know it, is the, the wavy roof structure. Um, and now in summary, uh, the, the report came back that the, the actual depot was not safe. So the Consequence of that is very quickly over a matter of days, we had to relocate the entire fleet um, operation. Um, that has resulted in us moving to an annex um, of, of one of the, of the depot facilities that's currently there, but also um, using third parties to service our HGV vehicles. The intention going forward, due to the extent of the repairs that would be required, would be to fully demolish that building um, and rebuild something which was fit for purpose and also reflected to the move of the council away from diesel uh, vehicles and into um, electric. And that leads us on to um, the whole purpose um, of the move to, to Bells Hill and, and Ward Park um, depots is that we will um, accelerate our move towards an electric fleet. Um, that will include the increasing the, the power supply um, to both these depots and also um, introduce introduction of additional charging points. And that will put us in a very good position to meet any of our requirements with regards to that. Um, just in terms of the uh, further efficiencies that, that, are, that are getting um, uh, brought in, is that we are looking to introduce waste transfer stations at both the Ward Park and Netherton recycling centres, and that will help both land and waste, which will allow us to um, actually bulk waste at these areas, um, and that will reduce our overall disposal costs for those materials. So really, in, in summary, um, convener, the recommendation really is just to note the steps taken um, already with regards to the um, movement of from 10 down to 5 depots and also the movement towards an electric fleet. Thank you. Thanks for, thanks for that, Andrew. Very comprehensive report there. Uh, Wally, you want to come in? Wally uh, Goldie. Thanks, Convener. Just a, a couple of things. First of all, I'd like to thank Andrew for moving forward on the electric vehicle stuff. That's a very positive thing. Uh, just a, a question, and I'm, I, I know it's only August, but we're talking about, <laughs> I'm talking about winter maintenance again. Uh, are we confident that in reducing the amount of depots that we have? I know the gritters, Nicole's furnished me information where our gritters and that are kept. Are we confident that uh, our gritters are in the correct place and we will have sufficient fallback if there's an issue with one of those depots? Or whatever, Andrew's already mentioned an unsafe depot or that. Um, just the fact we've got them in two, are they in the right place? And are we confident that essentially should some disaster befall one of the depots, we can move them elsewhere. Andrew? Yep, I could I could come in there. Thanks, Convener. That's, that's an excellent question, Councillor Goldie, and it's something that we've posed ourselves, that um, as you reduce the number of depots, you also increase the risk that if anything happens to one of those depots, then it has a, a significantly greater uh, impact. And I think what I would, um, to take a bit of confidence from it, that um, we found out on Friday afternoon that we would have to completely relocate our fleet um, in terms of fleet maintenance, and by the Monday morning, that was fully up and operational. Um, we do have, you know, we're fortunate within North Lanarkshire actually, that we do have a number of locations that we could um, co-locate these, uh, or all our vehicles to, um, but guaranteed that that is now part of our ongoing review of our contingency arrangements, and that will have to be in place, um, because it, it could be something as simple as a road accident right out the, the at the entrance of the thing, you know, how do we get the vehicles out to get them somewhere else? I don't know, but we've got two accesses um, in, um, to, in our main Bells Hill depot, so that would do that one. So so that certainly has been considered. OK, thanks for that, Andrew. Again, I mean, that was sort of unseen work that went on. The, the departments we spoke about at the start, you know, a crisis arisen on a Friday afternoon by the Monday. It was taken care of. So 
Thanks for, very much for all that hard work. I don't see any further people in with any questions. Um, so, in an appoint you to the recommendations on page 23, and I ask you, uh, well, it's really for noting this. Is, so, are we happy with that? Sorry, convener, I've just received a, a request for a question oh, from Councillor Mooney. From Nora, Nora Mooney. Sorry, guys, I'm a wee bit um, slow with the mark today. I've got a broken scaphoid and a chipped um, oh, shoulder bone on the other side, that. so <laughs> I'm struggling a wee bit with the movement side of things and writing things down. I had a handy assistant bring me a cup of tea a minute ago. Um, I just want to ask a wee question about the financial impact, if that's all right. Now, I'm aware that the capital budget and the revenue budget are two different things. However, it does say that the capital spend would be just short of half a million um, to create an annual revenue saving of £60,000 a year, which effectively would take eight years to hit a break-even point with the spend. Um, I'm just wondering what the thoughts are with regards to that, because it seems that we're... And I understand that there are two different budgets, but it seems a bit daft that we're spending half a million on one budget and it will take us eight years to see any kind of break-even point in the other one. And I know it does say as well about potential capital receipts, but their potential capital receipts are not guaranteed capital receipts. So I'm just I'm just wondering what people's thoughts are in that. Andrew, do you want to come in? Yeah, please. Yep, certainly. The 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 sixty thousand pounds is is what will what will happen um because of, of what was proposing here, but it also discounts the hundred and sixty thousand pounds that's already been saved. So that would make it three hundred and twenty. There's also additional um savings that will come as a result of Ward Park, as a result of the route efficiencies. That's not not in the paper as well. So it's perfectly um right to point that out and to be to be fair, maybe we should have been more elaborate on that in um, Councillor Mooney. Um, but also in terms of the capital receipt, they are they are fairly substantial capital receipts. Um, when you look at the the size of the the depots that we will be vacating, um, and we think any sort of capital spend that that we will um, allocate against the depot rationalisation will be more uh, than covered by um, the sale of the um, the assets that are surplus to requirements. Um, thank you for that. Just on that note, though, you were talking about one of the potential capital receipts. So I take it one of those is if you park gardens, but I'm aware that there's a current cat in for that, and there's a potential second cat about to be submitted. So I'll know there is a substantial receipt it, potentially in the offering for that. But if the cat's received, then that receipt wouldn't be there anymore. So I'm just wondering, you know, are the rest of the capital receipts in the same league as that, or you know, or the lesser amount. It's just, just to get a picture on it. The accountant in me wants to kind of know a bit more about these figures. Andrew, and, and, yep, perfectly, perfectly entitled to ask that question as well. No, definitely. When you take into account, um, you know, um, uh, uh, the other depot facilities, they are fairly substantial into, you know, um, well into six figures and seven figure sums. So we are more than capable of, re of recovering all our capital costs. Also, as we move towards our, our fleet, um, there is the opportunity to sell a considerable amount of our um, diesel vehicles and, and higher in uh, electric vehicles as well. So there is the overall business case is sound um, for the actual depot rationalisation. I think perhaps maybe it was included in a previous report, Councillor. So maybe I can maybe have a look at that for you as well. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that. Thanks for that, Andrew. So colleagues, can I then ask you to note this report then in the recommendations on page twenty three? Thank you. Moving on to item number four on the agenda, which is a revocation of the Crowy Air Quality Management Area. This is a very good news story. Andrew, are you going to speak to that? Yep, I will do. Thanks very much, Convener. Yeah, just to say that obviously the, the Croy Air Quality Management Area was declared back in 2011, and air quality management areas are declared where there's a significant exceedance of a particular pollutant. Um, in this case, it was particulate matter, which is uh, small particles, basically, and the, the prime source of that uh, was the quarry uh, within the, the, the Croy area. And the actual the boundary of the, the air quality management areas is shown in uh, Appendix 1. But however, since we, as soon as we declared that, um, the quarry more or less ceased operations or reduced operations. So for the past eight years, um, we have been measuring uh, the particular matter in that area taking into account the fluctuations in the quarry's activity. And every single year since then, they have been measured below uh, the national air quality uh, levels. 
So based on that evidence that we have, we are now in a position where we really can't justify uh, the continuation of the air quality management area within Croy. And the, the recommendation to committee is obviously to, to revoke uh, the air quality management area. It doesn't mean that we will stop the, that monitoring uh, tomorrow. Uh, we will continue with it for a further year just to ensure that the decision taken is the right one. Um, and just to give a committee some comfort, this is the third air quality management area that, that we would be revoking. Um, we had previously one in Hart Hill um, and also one in Moody'sburn. In particular, the one in Moody'sburn was a direct result of the creation of the new M80 uh, motorway. So the purpose of these air quality management areas is to highlight um, air quality issues within areas, introduce measures which will actually reduce that air quality or improve that air quality. So by doing that, um, we really have to reflect the improvement in the air quality, and that's why we should be um, revoking it. So really, the recommendation to the committee is more than that, is that we um, note the contents of the report, but also endorse and approve the revocation of the air quality management area. Happy to take any questions, convener. Thanks for that, Andrew. I uh, see Willie, Willie Goldie and then Greg Lennon. Willie, please. Thanks, convener. It's just this is welcome. I've watched this over the last few years drop down to the stage where we can actually get rid of it. Do we have how many do we have in North Lanarkshire? Do we still have some problems? Well, this is well, actually where they are. Yeah. Yeah. Andrew. Sorry, I'm on mute there. Yeah, we do have I think it's a further four air quality management areas <coughs> within, within places like Motherwell Chapel Hall. Um, and we continue to monitor them. They they are not significantly above, indeed, if they are above at all, um, the levels, but because of just the, the, the change in nature and the highlight that, that it actually brings and the um, the drive to try and reduce air quality or improve air quality within that area, they do remain in place at present, but they are continually under review. And thanks for that. Um, Greg? Thanks, Chair. Andrew, in relation to you just touched on it there, uh, Moody's Burn Air Quality Reports, could I potentially get a copy of them, please, to obviously see exactly what the air quality results are coming back at in Moody's Burn? And if it's the case that you kind of know off the top of your head, do you know if it's a reduction in Moody's Burn or are we increasing due to the motorway being built next to it? No, uh, no there's, there's been an overall um, reduction, councillor, um, which is why we revoked the, the air quality management area. Um, we still do have monitoring points in around Moody's Burn. So what I do is I'll, I'll ask that we get a copy of those sent to you, Councillor, if that's OK. Perfect, Andrew. Thank you. Supplementary, Chair. There you go. Uh, in relation to that, I'm not aware that it was a BBC report done, I think it was last year, where it highlighted Christon in particular at the Muirhead uh, Junction. It was one of the worst areas for air quality in relation to the Northern Corridor. Now, within that, Andrew, that report came back to say it was as busy as Byers Road. Now, I take it that an air quality survey will be conducted at that area or else nearby, or is that something that's going to be forgotten? I don't think it'll be forgotten. Andrew, would you like to respond to that, please? No, it, it definitely won't be forgotten. And I think from, from memory, I think we did question the validity of what was actually being, being stated in that in that report. However, what I will do is we do have a, a, an air quality management officer so I'll ask them to provide you with information on that, uh, Councillor Lennon, at the same time as they're providing you information on Moody's Burn. Ideal. Could Councillor Anderson get copied into that, since that's our word as well, Andrew? Okay. Well, I would copy on all the councillors in that area. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Okay, Nora, you want to come in? Thank you. Um, you know, I've, I've, on reading the report, yeah, definitely a good news story. Um, and I do note that it does say it's because of the reduction in activities at the Croy Quarry, which is obviously um, has a direct impact on the lack of infrastructure work that's taken place over the last couple of years. However, if there was an increase in the infrastructure work and then an increase in the quarry activity, I'm just wondering if there's a likelihood of us starting up this um, air management uh, well, it's the AQME survey again, or whether you know once we take it away, then that's it for Gosling about. It's just I'm, I'm just a bit concerned if the infrastructure did start to build and the quarry did start to work again, that you know it'd be hard to put back in place again. Ask the same question to conveners, Andrew. Um, yes, we certainly will. It doesn't mean if you know if things now develop in that quarry and we've, we've taken this decision because there doesn't appear to be any long-term plan to re restart the quarry. 
Um, however, if it did, certainly we would start the, the, the process again of monitoring the air quality levels in the area. And quarry operations now and quarry operations maybe 15, 10 years ago are maybe quite different as well. So there's a whole range of factors that we've taken into consideration. But yeah, if it started up again, we would certainly um, start the monitoring again. Thanks for that, Andrew. Now, colleagues, I don't see anybody else want to come in with any questions or observations. So can I then direct you to recommendations on page 29 and ask for your approval on this? Is that agreed? OK, thanks very much. Moving on to item number five, which is a smart waste monitoring project. And another very good news story here. Nicole, I think you're going to say a few words on this. No, it will be myself. Oh, Andrew again, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Getting officers mixed up. Hey, right, Andrew, on you go. Sorry. Just get, had, had reference to smart in it, which is why you glossed over myself, Councillor. Like, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'll never say that. I've never. <laughs> Okay. Um, no, the, the, the details in the report, obviously, but effectively, the, the council wants to work in partnership with Zero Waste Scotland, and it's to undertake a pilot across um, five thousand households um, within the council area. The intention would be that we would apply, we would uh, attach tags to each of the the wheel bins that, that service those uh, five thousand properties, uh, and also put um, vehicle waiting technology on three of our vehicles. It's a two-year pilot. Um, the first year would really about in installing and procuring all the, um, the tags and the, the um, equipment that we need, and also collecting data, um, in other words, the waste collection data from these 5,000 uh, properties. During year two, different campaigns will be run within the council in terms of how we want to try and get our residents to recycle more. And then following each of these campaigns, we would then compare the data within each of the bins. That would then give us an indication as to what interventions, what, what campaigns work best to get people to recycle more. Um, obviously, um, that data would then be reported back um, to committee at a later date. But this isn't just wouldn't apply to North Lanarkshire, as Zero Waste Scotland would then apply that throughout Scotland. So they're coming to North Lanarkshire because obviously they realise that potential here within to recycle more um, is, is there. So that's why they've chosen us as a pilot area. The actual um, exact areas that we're going to be targeting with regards to the pilot are still to be determined. But obviously, when that happens in partnership with Zero Waste Scotland, we will be coming back to the to those councillors and wards that it's affected. So you're fully aware um, of the, the the pilot and when it actually starts. There is no financial implication to the council for this. It will be fully funded um, to the tune of 150,000 pounds. Uh, by Zero Waste Scotland, and that will include um, all the equipment that's required and also a, a support officer for a 12 month period um, as well. Uh, and obviously, like I've said, as soon as we find out any results from it, um, they obviously will bring back further reports to committee um, so they, they're aware of um, the outcome of that pilot. And really, the recommendation to committee is that we do support it and we do um, introduce the Smart Waste Monitoring Project. And happy to take any questions, Convener. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Again, it shows that this council's willing to do the bit and work with Zero Waste Scotland and anybody else for that matter to drive up our uh, recycling within our area. And I think we're doing as much as we possibly can. Uh, Wally, do, um, sorry, Wally Goldie, you want to come in? Thanks, Convener. Uh, just a couple of things. I uh, really welcome this uh, initiative and partnership between Zero Waste Scotland and the council. And also welcome the money that's coming from zero waste, <laughs> zero waste <Yeah. laughs> to the council. Uh, it's just that on the ongoing costs. Andrew said there it was kind of fully covered, uh, but at two point seven of it dedicated project support role for twelve months. Is this by zero waste Scotland, or are we doing this in house? And is it going to be fully funded? Will there be any, any ongoing costs in the future to the council mm -hmm. on this once this project's finished? Or will that depend on how successful the trial is going to be? This thing is currently, if a bin is lost, damaged, or stolen, the resident has to repay, has to pay to get another bin. If one of the bins in the trial is lost, damaged, or stolen, will the resident have to pay for that, or will the council cover the cost of that one? Uh, and finally, I just hope that when we get all the data in, we can use it to educate people. Uh, and to kind of encourage them to recycle more. Thanks. Absolutely. Absolutely. Andrew, do you want to pick your points up there, please? Yep, we'll do. Um, thanks, Councillor Goldie. Yep. The first, um, the, the 12 month support, that's just for the 12 month support officer. So they will be in place um, uh, actually introducing the, um, the recycling um, initiatives, that type of thing. 
So, but there won't be any any um, uh, cost to the council. The only cost to us would be obviously um, our officers' support throughout this. But that's something that that wouldn't be significant. That's something that we could pick up on a day-to-day -day operation. Um, the lost, damaged, or stolen bins. Um, if a if a bin is lost, damaged, or stolen, then we would we would follow the same principle. And if it's a recycling bin, then it's perfect. It's free of charge to replace that. But if it's a if it's a, a grey bin, then we would uh, apply the same charge. Mm -hmm. But when that is replaced, then we would have to then go out and retag that bin um, at the same time. Um, the the data mm -hmm. yeah, that's the whole purpose of this councillor Goldie. It's why we're doing it. Um, we've we've done all we can. We've provided all the bins. The residents have been more than patient with us and putting up with the four bins. But we do need to try and drive up a recycling rate, and this is hopefully one way that that will be done. Okay, thanks for Andrew. Um, uh, Nathan, Nathan Wilson. Uh, thanks, convener. Um, just three, three quite short questions for me. The first is, I'm just wondering, as as any other councils also entering and this type of or is North event the first? Uh, second question is mentioned in paragraph two point five, but Andrew's also. The decisions yet been made on um, what the households that will be participating in the scheme. I was just wondering, is there any thoughts at this stage on whether um, the five thousand households going to be concentrated in one or two particular wards, or is it going to be you know much more evenly spread throughout North Lanarkshire? And the third point, I just want clarification on uh, for any households who, who might be chosen to participate in the initiative, but who maybe don't want to or feeling uncomfortable about it. Is there going to be a facility for those households eh, to, to opt out, or is it something that, which is the council envisages being mandatory what, once it's all up and running? Thanks. Andrew. Thanks, Gina. Thanks, um, uh, Councillor Boxen. Yep, um, the, the, I think from memory, and I'll check this out and I'll come back to you, Councillor, but I think there's a couple other local authorities in Scotland that are also tied into the pilot, just so we get um, you know, a quality across um, the different types of council areas that they were they were um, undertaking the pilots in. But I'll come back to you with that information. Um, in terms of the, the location, it will have to be fairly concentrated because the, the weighing technology that's going to be on the vehicles will have to be only on three vehicles. So we'll have to undertake that within a certain um, geographical location. So it will be a particular route that will be chosen. Um, and again, once we find that, we'll come back and let uh, local elected members know. And in terms of households, when we undertake this pilot, then all households will be contacted just to advise them this is happening because obviously they'll see the, 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 the we're installing tags on the bins. But yeah, if any household has any except you know wants to be excluded from it, then we can't force people to undertake that. Um, so we will um, exclude them, but hopefully sufficient number um, of households will we'll see the benefit of it um, and we'll be happy to participate. Okay, thanks for that, Andrew. Now I can see. Um... Councillor Ashraf's next. Then I think Kevin Doherty is wave, waving to get in. He's not put his name on the chat bar, but I can see him. So I'll take uh, Janaid, then I'll take Kevin, then I'll take Mary. And I think Councillor Damashu has just come in there. So Councillor Ashraf, uh, Janaid, on you go. That's the old chair. That, that was before Kevin. Oh, Doherty. sorry. I Sorry, Greg. Kevin was waving first. So I'll be uh, Janaid, then Kevin, then yourself, Greg. Right? Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Janaid. Uh, Thank you. Uh, thank you, Karina. Um, yeah, it was just in relation also to that uh, point before that Nathan had made about uh, whether or not people would uh, would it be in a concentrated area or not. I mean, are people being made aware before the, these tags will be put on? Like, so will somebody go to the door, explain to them what's happening? Will there be a letter sent out beforehand? Um, is there any sort of engagement with them before these tags are added, or are they just going to be added? And I mean, how, how's this process going to be carried out? Uh, and then I had one other question after that. Andrew, will you answer that one? Yep, can you know? Yeah, we will be will be contacting each of the, the households that are going to be affected. I don't think we'll be able to chap in every door, but certainly we'll be lettering everyone that's affected. Okay, Janine, do you want to supplementary? Yeah, some, uh, it's just uh, in relation to the information though that's coming back. So who's in charge of this information that's um, coming off of these bins and uh, on our um, trucks as well? I mean, does this information go to Zero Waste Scotland or is it our information and we take care of it or is it... Uh, who, who, does it go any further than the Zero Waste Scotland North Lancashire Council? Uh, I think some people would be wary about that sort of information. Um, but uh, if you could just 
highlight where, who, who's in charge, who's the data controller basically, and who's a data user, and just all see how that's all working. Andrew, yep. The the, the data will, will will be controlled by Zero Waste Scotland, but it will be shared with North Lanarkshire Council. Um, they will then use that Zero Waste Scotland that is to inform um, a national uh, program of campaign um, to try and get people to recycle more. Uh, so that's where they'll use that data. They won't use it data at, at, at a household level, and um, they'll be using it just as a general. Um, we introduced um, this campaign, and the recycling rate increased by five percent. So that's that's the sort of the level they would look at. They wouldn't look at it at a specific property level. Okay, right, thanks, no worries. Thank you. Thanks, um, Kevin. Thanks, Chair. Chair, it's just a, a question for Andrew, if he doesn't mind. Is the it seems to be an awful lot of investments put into these new machinery and the bin lorries and, and the, the way and the computers. Is the, is the operators going to be given like a handheld terminal in that to operate uh, when people are overweight in their bins? Andrew? Uh, no, there they, they won't be any interaction with our own operatives. It's uh, the, the weight will be registered by the, the chip as it goes into the back of the hopper. Um, so it's automatically collected there. Um, so there won't be any handheld technology from our own uh, staff council. It's all going to be recorded through the vehicle. Um, will, will there be targets set future for the residents on ways? On, on, are there going to be limits to how much way that their bin can carry? Uh, no, that 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 that's not the intention of the of the pilot. And to be honest, it, the weight the weight of the bin, and and we can't do that because. The weight you get in a 360 bin will be different from a 240, which is different from a, from a 140. So it all depends on the size of the bin is the weight. So so that's not the intention of this um, of this pilot. It's simply to do with how does um, you know recycling initiatives impact on the amount of waste that's been discarded and recycled within a within a council area. Thanks very much. Thank you, Andrew. Um, Greg. Chair, yeah, thank you. I don't know if I missed Andrew's comments in relation to what Councillor Goldie just asked him. Could you clarify again, Andrew, if there's any additional operating cost to this once the pilot period's over, or if you've any projected cost in relation to how much this is going to cost to continue? Andrew, no, there's 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 no additional costs. Um, the whole purpose of this is to actually reduce the cost of our disposal because we should hopefully recycle more by having a better campaign. Um, but this isn't. It's not your intention to extend this technology to every single one of our vehicles. This is simply um, information gathering by Zero Waste Scotland, so they can have a better targeted recycling campaigns in the future. Okay, thanks for that, Mary. Supplementary chair, oh, sorry. sorry. Just for clarification, then Andrew, it's just to see that again. Once this pilot project's over and done with, that that's kind of us and our involvement ceases. Yes, it's, it's a two-year um, project, councillor, um, and after that, um, as far as I'm aware at the moment, that will be it. Um, it discontinues. Obviously, if there is any reason as to why that should be extended, um, then obviously we would come back to committee with that with that proposal. Um, but at the moment, it's just a two-year pilot, and that's it. Thanks, Thanks for that, Mary. Um, yeah, I appreciate everything that's been said, and I'm all for recycling and anything we could do to increase the input of it. But what worries me strictly is the people who recycle it, such as Viridor down at Brigade, is causing major problems for the residents down there. Mary, Mary, I need to stop. That's nothing to do with what's in this report. That is no, but I was hoping that we get, is, there a, is there a fully up? To if you want to bring that offline, we can speak of that offline. That has nothing to do with this report, Mary, I'm afraid. Sorry about that. Right, OK. Paul, Paul Damasio. Hi, folks. Apologies if I missed uh, Andrew's answer to this earlier. Um, and a number of my points have already been answered. But in terms of the, the likely geography uh, where we'd be looking to, you know, Implement this pilot. Uh, presumably, I think someone else asked earlier it was going to be. Presumably, we'll do it over a, a spread out geography. How, how are we going to? What, what's the thought process in terms of that? Basically, um, I don't know what else I was going to ask. Yeah, is there likely to be an update paper on this? Or, I mean, how quickly are we expecting this to go into implementation? Is it likely to be before the next committee? 
Um, and lastly, I think Councillor Lennon uh, touched on this point, uh, and you obviously answered the fact that it, at this moment in time, it doesn't appear that we all there'll be a continuation of it. Should there should there be at the end of this process the should it be something that we're looking at to to continue? Can we get a general idea of what the cost implication would be there? You know, how much do these uh, tags and the units for the vehicles generally cost? Again, Paul, it's this is a pilot program. Program it's going to last for two years. So to get into it after that is is guesswork just now. But Andrew, do you want to pick up any other points there, please? Yeah, I've just I've, I think there's there's three points there, um, councillor. So. In terms of how do we how do we pick the areas, um, and it will be focused just in in, in the, similar to the sort of previous answer. We will have to focus it in a specific area because the technology is not going to be um, within all forty nine of our vehicles. It's only going to be on three of them, so we will have to go with specific routes. Um, in terms of how, how what geography, what areas are we going to pick? Um, I, that hasn't been determined yet, but my 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 guess would be that we wouldn't pick the really bad areas. Because for obvious reasons, because there's very little we can very little improvement, we wouldn't pick the really good areas either because they're recycling. I think you'll find it will be the areas in between where we can make a difference. That's where we'll probably focus the pilot. But again, we will come back with details of that to the local elected members um, once we've actually done that. In terms of the update paper, I, I, my intention was I wouldn't be bringing anything back unless there was any value in it. Um, so for the first year, it's all just about data gathering. It's just about installing the technology. It's just about picking the routes. So we'll do that, and then maybe after you know we actually start getting results back in in terms of when we launch recycling initiatives, um, then we can report back and you know what the success or otherwise was of them. So I wouldn't envisage we would begin having any further reports on this um, unless we, we change fundamentally you know the, the the proposal that was in this paper um, for another you know eighteen months, two years that type of thing. Okay, thanks for that, Janaid. I see you want to come back in. Okay, on you go. Uh, thank you for that, convener. Um, it was just in relation to obviously the answer that uh, Andrew had given me um, earlier, saying that um, information won't be broken down per household. Uh, I was just looking at the report on two point four. It does say at the on two point four that unique references will be issued to each property, but no personal data will be gathered. So it feels as if like the information will be able to be broken down per property. But uh, even if it won't be able to be specifically identified, I suppose. Um, I think the only issue I have here, uh, convener, is that basically I just kind of feel as if, uh, although this project is positive, definitely uh, uh, feel comfortable in terms of the trajectory of the state in terms of pushing people to recycle more. I just have a little bit of an issue that I just don't think it's a good precedent for any company to really get access to constituents' information or behaviours by just agreeing to pay the council some money to run a program alongside them. I feel as if we need a little bit more. Uh, we need a little bit more firmed up sort of a uh, situation um, clarity uh, when it comes to the information of these constituents. And I do realise it's got to do with how much waste people are getting rid of per household. And you might be thinking, why would somebody even want that information? But obviously, in the sort of digital age that we're living in, uh, information like this becomes more and more valuable. So I feel as if there needs to be slightly more clarity, a little bit more information in terms of uh, where this information will be used, when it will be taken away, that sort of thing. If that could be brought back at a later date, or if uh, that could be sent out, because uh, I just don't feel comfortable with uh, somebody just coming in one hundred fifty thousand mm -hmm. pounds access to what could be potentially very good information, and um, if something could be answered on that. You know. Again, um, I'll bring Andrew in just now, but again, uh, outset of this, this is a Scottish government initiative, zero waste Scotland, and it's to gather data to try and force up recycling. Andrew, do you want to pick it up on that, please? Yeah, and I think it's, it's it's a fair point, Councillor, because I, I think you're really finding a data protection requirements and everything. Now that will be this zero waste Scotland are uh, you know just as much uh, aligned to that as as any other organisation. So they will have to protect the data um, of anything that they that they recover. Again, we won't be identifying individual households; it will be areas that will be identified, just as as the, the report says. But what I'll, what I'll do, Councillor Ashraf, just to give you that extra comfort, I'll. I'll ask the, the project officer to maybe provide us with that detail of background and how the data will be handled and how it will be protected at the same time. Thanks for that, Andrew. The colleagues, I don't see any further comments or questions. Can I then point you to the recommendation on page 33 and ask for approval for this? Is that agreed? 
don't see any otherwise minded. So moving on to contracts, and number six is a fleet procurement of tyres. And again, colleagues, this report is here for noting. Are you happy to note that report? Won't see anybody saying anything otherwise. So we'll move on to item number seven. Again, it's a contract awarded, awarded below the committee approval. And again, this is here for noting, colleagues. Are you happy to note that? Don't see any further comments. So, colleagues, that brings us to the conclusion of today's, today's business. Can I thank you all very much for your attendance? Very well behaved. And I've got to say, we started on time. So, thanks very much. Just get the Environmental Committee on all the time. We'll get this done, no bother. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, convener. <laughs> thank you.